Good morning, thank you. Um, and welcome to our hearing uh, on overseeing the overseers, uh, the Council of Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency. Among the most important and misunderstood jobs in our federal government is that of federal inspectors general. These unique federal employees straddle the executive and legislative branches and serve as critical components of effective oversight. IGs, better known by the public as federal watchdogs, help Congress uncover waste, fraud, and abuse at federal agencies, and they help agencies to find efficiencies that can improve service to the American public. IGs have served in this sometimes unpopular role for more than 40 years. In fiscal year 2017 alone, the IGs identified $32.7 billion in potential savings across the federal government as documented in the nearly 4,000 reports released. IGs have also recovered $21.9 billion from settlements and civil judgments resulting from nearly 22,000 investigations. For American taxpayers, that means that for every dollar we invest to fund these officers, we can expect a $22 return. And IGs do more than save the federal government money. They improve agency safety, call balls and strikes on agencies that fail to follow establishment fair processes and procedures, and they perform work that has the potential to save lives, like the Agency for International Development and its work examining the lessons learned from the agency's Ebola response efforts. Today's hearing examines the role of the Council of Inspectors General on integrity and efficiency and, and the role it plays in continuously improving the IG community. This interagency IG Council, known as SIGI, serves as a hub of oversight, professionalization, and information sharing across the IG community. Eleven years ago, Congress established SIGI by merging a council for the smaller IGs and one for the larger IGs. And SIGI began operations in 2009, making this SIGI's 10-year anniversary. The progress SIGI has made over the last decade is commendable. SIGI has tapped talented workforces to create Oversight.gov, a one-stop shop for all reports issued by any of the 74 offices of Inspector General. This online tool allows the public and Congress to look across agency boundaries and identify top management challenges across the government. This tool also allows for real-time identification of issues that plague the federal government and give us as Congress a chance to generate enterprise solutions. We're here today to find ways to help SIGI build on these successes and examine ways to further explore efficient community-wide solutions that increase the independence of the IG community. After all, the community whose mission is to find efficiencies across government should challenge itself to find those same opportunities at home. I believe that SIGI's leadership can advance these goals. Most importantly, this hearing will probe whether SIGI is effectively performing its most important function, watching the watchdogs. The unique nature of the IG position makes oversight of the IGs complicated but essential. Currently, the Integrity Committee, which operates within SIGI, is charged with investigating allegations of wrongdoing against IG officials. The Integrity Committee has at times operated without transparency, which is in contrast with the values of the IG community itself, whose greatest strength is sunlight. I often say that IGs 
the overseers of agencies need to be as pure as driven snow because if they're not, all of their work is tainted. And that is critical. The IG has to be respected by both sides of the aisle, by both bodies here in Congress, and by, more importantly, the public. I've also got particular concerns about offices of inspectors general who share their IT service with agencies that they oversee. Congress deliberately created the IGs 40 years ago to be independent from the agencies they oversee. While we trust agencies would never inappropriately access investigative materials created by their IGs, I am concerned that even the appearance of potential impropriety is a risk to IG independence. I think SIGI has been working in this area and could play a pivotal role in finding a collaborative cross-community solution to the problem. I also believe that SIGI needs to be more transparent. Uh, I've had my own personal experience um, several years ago and, and was left from, far from being satisfied. Uh, when two mem members of the committee filed a complaint, um, we, w we witnessed the process firsthand. And it was a dismissive process, it was not a transparent process, and it raised real concerns. And I know, Mr. Horowitz, you and I met about that at the time, and I know that you were not unsympathetic to the concerns raised. And I'm eager to hear what progress we're making and need to make uh, as we proceed. In celebrating 10 years of SIGI, we should also examine SIGI's role in filling IG vacancies by helping the president, agency heads, and Congress to find qualified candidates for vacant IG positions. Today, we'll examine whether those responsibilities need clarification or reinforcement. Too often, administrations do not understand the role of the Inspector General and attempt to infuse politics into the selection process for a new IG or worse. And again, that taints the process and compromises the integrity um, uh, of the IG. Finally, this hearing will examine recent transparency measures SIGI and its Integrity Committee have adopted in its periodic reporting and explore options for codifying these reforms. We seek to ensure that the watchdog's watchdog remains above reproach by increasing the transparency and access to the Integrity Committee operations. And with that, I call upon the distinguished ranking member for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you for the work that you do. When I came to Washington, D.C., I wanted to make sure that government was accountable not only to the constituents of mine in North Carolina, but to all of America. And uh, it is the hardworking American taxpayers' dollars that we have to make sure that we protect and, uh, and certainly the offices of the inspectors general play a critical role in doing just that. Uh, as I came to Congress, uh, I didn't know what an inspector general was, uh, and now I've, I've come to learn that it is the frontline defense on making sure that waste, fraud, and abuse uh, are not pervasive within our federal government. Uh, your independence is, is key, and certainly our, our councils of inspectors general for integrity and efficiency, also known as SIGI, uh, we work on uh, acronyms around here, uh, are crucial to help providing uh, the IGs with uh, their support for that mission. And uh, Mr. Horowitz, let me just say that, uh, you know, your, your name probably gets invoked more by both sides of the aisle than you would care to, and it's not normally in your SIGI role that it does that, but I appreciate you being here and uh, certainly all of you in the role, uh, some of you, this is not your first rodeo on being here. In fact, I don't think it's your first rodeo for any of you uh, here today. And, and no matter how partisan this committee gets, no matter how partisan it gets, I'm confident that we can all agree that your role uh, and the roles of the inspectors general's mission is more important than ever. Uh, we must make sure that the inspector generals have the statutory authorities, the resources necessary to fully carry out their investigations, their audits, their reviews, uh, allegations of misconduct. And there are often times when at a subcommittee level or the full committee level where uh, I find uh, that the chairman and I are looking at those recommendations that the IGs make 
and whether uh, an administration, whether it is under the previous administration, under the Obama administration, or under the Trump administration, whether they're actually acting appropriately. And so you are, are critical uh, in that role. And, and so as we look at this on this 10th anniversary of, of the creation of SIGI, uh, I think the SIGI's mission transcends uh, individual government agencies. It's, it's all about making sure that you have the tools. I, for one, as a fiscal conservative, hate to spend money on just about anything that does not provide a return. You don't have to say amen. Uh, and so, uh, but on this particular thing, making sure that you're well-funded, that you have the tools, uh, there is not a dime's worth of difference between the chairman and I in terms of making sure that you're well-equipped. It's crucial that we work together to e examine the systems uh, that would actually provide real IG uh, reform. And just as recent, I think, as yesterday, uh, the chairman and I are working together on a piece of legislation that actually goes a little bit further and, and making sure that that independence uh, is, is truly there and that we have objective oversight. I want to thank all of our witnesses uh, being here today. Um, I want to uh, regress just a little bit. I need to make uh, mention something that the chairman and I have talked about. It has been a long-standing committee policy that we allow minority witnesses. And in fact, the House rules provide for those. And uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we asked for uh, the Inspector General for WMATA, of which we've had a number of hearings to be here. Uh, and, and for that particular Inspector General, who is not a member of SIGI, but also is something that we need to examine in terms of the tools that they have to do what, what truly is important because WMATA, we've had a number of hearings where deaths and injuries have been reported where it has been critical to this committee and for us to not be uh, in a position to have uh, that Inspector General here is, is uh, certainly something that we don't agree with we would encourage uh, us working in a bipartisan w uh, manner as we go forward to hopefully uh, highlight that important testimony that needs to come forward. And I yield back. I thank my friend, and I thank him for how he's approached uh, that issue. Let me just assure my friend, um, and uh, apparently there was some miscommunication, um, I would never knowingly deny my friend or anyone on this side of the aisle, their right to have a minority witness. That happened to us, and I know how it felt. So I would never knowingly do that. We, I honestly, I'll take, I honestly felt that this hearing was about federal IGs. The Metro IG is not a federal official. And this was about SIGI, and by not being a member, a federal official, neither is he a member of SIGI. Uh, and I, so I saw this as sort of a, a good government fairly narrow in scope kind of hearing, important, but narrow in scope. And, and as my friend knows, uh, we have the Metro IG scheduled as a witness on a hearing dedicated to Metro on October 22nd. Uh, and I felt that plus the request of the IG of Metro to look into the matter of Mr. Evans and the ethical questions that have been raised by documents made available both to the minority and the majority uh, that we had we had met the, uh, the concerns you raised. Uh, and so as we move forward, I hope you and I can uh, make sure that our lines of communication are what they need to be so that we don't have a misunderstanding. But I want to assure my friend there was no intent by this chairman or by our side of the aisle to deny the minority its rights. And I absolutely am committed to those rights because I remember under the former chairman, Mr. Issa, being denied those rights in effect, uh, and, uh, and it didn't feel good, and I would never inflict it on, on my friend uh, or members of the minority. So uh, with that assurance, uh, we will move forward and do better. Um, the distinguished ranking member of the full committee is with us. Mr. Jordan, did you have anything you wanted to, uh, to say? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just associate myself with the remarks from uh, the ranking member and, and the remarks from uh, opening statement from the chairman, and I appreciate the chairman's um, statement relative to the uh, the witness issue that was raised. Uh, but mostly I want to thank the 
witnesses who are here today for the good work they do and for taking the time to appear before us today. And I look forward to uh, asking questions a little later. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. And now uh, let me introduce our three witnesses. We're joined by Michael Horowitz, who is the Inspector General of the Department of Justice, who has appeared before this committee in the past. And is a great example, I think, uh, of why integrity and transparency uh, are so important, because he's had some very difficult assignments uh, and has been well received by both sides of the aisle, despite the political, politically charged nature of some of those assignments. And that's because you were trusted on both sides. And I think that trust is, is just critical for the effectiveness of your job. And he also serves as the chairman of the Council of Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency, relevant to today's topic. Kathy Buller is the Inspector General of the Peace Corps, uh, and we're delighted to have you. She's also the Executive Chair of the Council of SIGI Legislative Committee. Welcome. And Scott Dahl is the Inspector General of the Department of Labor. He's Chairman of the SIGI uh, Integrity Committee, uh, important committee for SIGI. If all three of you would rise uh, and raise your right hands, it is our tradition to swear in our witnesses. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Let the record show the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Uh, and as we begin, without objection, I want to assure you that your full written statement will be made part of the full record, and we would ask you to summarize your testimony in a five-minute uh, time frame, and we'll begin with you, Mr. Horowitz. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Connolly, Ranking Member Meadows, members of the subcommittee. Um, appreciate the invitation to testify today. Inspectors General play a critical role in keeping the public informed about how their government operates and in ensuring the taxpayer money is used effectively and efficiently. The chair recognized the tens of millions of dollars, in, tens of billions of dollars in potential savings that IGs identify each year mm -hmm. and the strong return on investment we provide to the taxpayers. Um, as you noted, we call balls and strikes and the facts as they are, whether popular or unpopular. I can tell you it's mostly unpopular. Um, but um, as I like to say as a graduate of Brandeis University, quoting former Justice Brandeis, sunlight is the best disinfectant, and we find that as inspectors general. Uh, the Council of Inspectors General, or SIGI, which I chair and which Congress created, 10 years ago has played an important role in assisting IGs in these oversight efforts. SIGI has fulfilled its mission by vigorously advocating for IG independence, which is a perpetual challenge for us in the IG community, developing top tier training academies, creating quality standards for our work, performing regular peer reviews, conducting cross-cutting reviews on issues that affect multiple federal agencies, and implementing a system of effective oversight of alleged misconduct within the IG community since we assumed responsibility for it from the FBI in 2017. I know we've talked um, before, as you noted, Mr. Chairman, about this issue, and we're certainly committed to continuing to work with you and, and the ranking member on the legislation you've introduced to figure and think about how we can further transparency efforts. In addition, as you noted, in October 2017, we launched Oversight.gov, where the public can go to see all of our work in one place. They can also follow us and follow Oversight.gov on Twitter, at Oversight.gov. By signing up, they will learn when new reports are issued across the IG community. We're proud that over 20,000 followers now on that, um, on Oversight.gov and SIGI, which is more than all but three of the 70 federal IGs in just two years. So it's proven to be a very popular, very effective way to get our information out to the public. And thanks to the funding provided by Congress, we have several initiatives underway to try and enhance Oversight.gov, including an open recommendations database and a website service for IGs to try and help them gain greater independence from their organizations. We also, earlier this summer, launched a first ever whistleblower website as part of Oversight.gov in furtherance of that effort. We've done all of this at SIGI with all of 23 employees, including detailees. That's the total workforce at SIGI to deal with training, to deal with all of the other related work that we're statutorily told to do, including integrity committee operations. Um, 
how we've done this, but we need a better funding mechanism. Because right now, the way SIGI's funded is through the voluntary contributions of 73 member organizations, which means we don't know what money and funding we're getting until all 73 of them go through the congressional appropriations process, or those that are appropriated through Congress, which, as you know, is a tedious, laborious process that isn't necessarily resolved by October 1st of each fiscal year. That's a challenge for us and something we look forward to talking about with this committee and thinking about how we can improve our future operations um, in, in that regard. We also have concerns about the impact on IG oversight when shutdowns occur. During shutdowns, OIG auditors are generally furloughed. But what happens with already awarded grants and contracts, that work continues. And so you have situations where tens or hundreds of billions of dollars in federal funding is out there, continuing to be used, but with no OIG oversight during a shutdown period. We also have IG vacancy issues. There are currently 12 of the 73 IG positions vacant. As you noted, those need to be filled, and we need those uh, nominations that need to occur to happen promptly. We have several legislative priorities that my colleague IG Buller will talk about, one of them being testimonial subpoena authority, a challenge we've regularly faced is getting witnesses who are no longer at the Justice Department to speak to us, including in whistleblower retaliation and sexual misconduct cases. Finally, I just want to thank this committee for passing legislation that would allow, that would allow my office to investigate alleged uh, misconduct by department attorneys when they act as lawyers in that capacity. Earlier this year, thanks to this committee's efforts, the House passed the Inspector General Access Act, um, co-sponsored by Chairman Cummings, Congressman Richmond, Congressman Heiss, and Congressman Lynch. Um, and hopefully that will be given swift consideration in the Senate. With that, I thank you again for your support for our work and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Horowitz. Uh, Ms. Buller. Chairman Conley, Ranking Member Meadows, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to appear before you today to discuss the work that SIGI and Inspectors General do to promote integrity and efficiency. As both the Inspector General for the Peace Corps and the Chair of the SIGI Legislation Committee, my testimony underscores how our community has provided effective oversight of the federal government, not only through our work as individual IGs, but also through our shared efforts at SIGI. For more than 40 years, IGs have held federal agencies accountable and helped Congress make informed decisions. In my 33 years in the IG community, we have transformed from a loose grouping of IGs into an oversight community that coordinates work, shares resources and guidance, and collectively provides better oversight. I was appointed as IG just months before SIGI was established. As a new IG, I benefited from having SIGI as a resource. In turn, as Legislation Committee Chair, I am proud to further SIGI's capacity to support the IG community. Since 2009, the Legislation Committee has typified one of SIGI's roles in the community. Each IG has its own relationship with Congress. However, on community-wide issues, we are more effective when we speak with one voice and better achieve one of SIGI's core missions to address integrity, economy, and effectiveness issues that transcend individual government agencies. For example, the IG community came together to help Congress pass the Inspector General Empowerment Act of 2016. The act restored Inspector General access to all agency records, addressing the most significant threat IGs faced to our ability to provide independent oversight. The Legislation Committee continues to advise Congress on future reforms that would benefit government oversight or address common challenges facing IGs. Each Congress, we issue legislative priorities. Our top reform proposals to strengthen government oversight or resolve challenges that IGs face under current law. While I have outlined our legislative priorities in my written uh, remarks, the three priorities I would like to highlight are testimonial subpoena authority, reforming the Program Fraud Civil, Rem Civil Remedies Act, or PIFRA, and protecting IG security vulnerability information. First, the inability to compel the testimony of critical witnesses can significantly hamper oversight. For example, if a federal employee under investigation for misconduct or whistleblower retaliation resigns, 
Most IGs would lack any authority to require the now former federal employee to cooperate with the investigation. Testimonial subpoena authority would help IGs answer critical questions that would otherwise go unanswered and hold bad actors accountable. The House unanimously supported testimonial subpoena authority for IGs during the last two Congresses, and the initiative has received bipartisan support in the Senate. We look forward to further engaging on this issue and hope for continued bipartisan support. Second, PIFRA's well-studied flaws have prevented agencies from holding small-dollar fraudsters accountable. Known as the Mini False Claims Act, PIFRA has been underused for more than 30 years. Its cumbersome, ambiguous requirements place unnecessary hurdles on agencies trying to recover from small-dollar fraud or false claims. For example, the dollar threshold set in 1986 should be increased, and agencies should be allowed to retain the defrauded funds they lost. Several straightforward changes to PIFRA would make it the viable tool it was intended to be. Third, we need to strengthen protections over IT vulnerability information under FOIA. Agencies and IGs study federal IT systems and produce detailed reports identifying exploitable weaknesses. Malicious entities could use that information to infiltrate and harm government IT systems. While FOIA protects classified and law enforcement information, no single exemption covers all IT security vulnerability information. A focused, nar narrowly tailored exemption would protect information that hackers could use to harm federal IT systems. Finally, I would like to thank the members and staff of this subcommittee and the full committee for supporting the IG community. In particular, two of our priorities were recently addressed in legislation that would protect employees of subgrantees from whistleblower retaliation and to ensure IG independence by requiring congressional notification when an IG is placed in non-duty status. We look forward to continuing to be a re an important resource to you as you pursue your oversight and legislative work. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Dahl. Quis custodiet ipsos custodies, a Latin phrase that roughly translates to who will watch the watchers, or as the chairman uh, framed it, who will watch the watchdogs? This timeless question was answered uh, for the inspectors general as government watchdogs decades ago with the creation of the integrity committee which investigates IGs for wrongdoing. I want to thank the subcommittee for calling this hearing and in particular the chairman for his abiding interest in protecting this central value of integrity uh, in our community. Um, indeed integrity is in Siggy's name. The integrity committee under SIGI uh, has worked to improve transparency in our processes and accountability in the IG community, but we recognize that more needs to be done. Uh, we know that we must vigilantly uh, 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 attend to these important issues uh, to maintain the credibility with our stakeholders, as the chairman noted. Uh, the purpose of the Integrity Committee is to serve as an independent and objective body to evaluate and investigate uh, allegations of wrongdoing by IGs, uh, designated um, uh, senior OIG officials, and top officials of the Office of Special Counsel. The Empowerment Act of 2016 transferred IC's leadership and program responsibilities from the FBI to SIGI. As the elected committee chair, uh, I have had the responsibility with the committee of managing this transition, including, for example, enacting new procedures directed at improving accountability and timeliness and transparency. Uh, we've worked to increase transparency uh, by scheduling meetings uh, with members of Congress and their staff uh, to go over our work and providing uh, greater detail in our 30-day uh, status letters and annual reports to Congress. Uh, we have also improved transparency with other stakeholders, uh, including the public, through a more interactive and informative website um, that makes it easier for the public to submit 
uh, complaints um, uh, about IGs. And we've also um, uh, conducted multiple training sessions with IGs on our, on our policies and procedures. But even with these improvements, the committee uh, acknowledges um, that additional progress needs to be made on transparency. At the same time, uh, we must assiduously adhere to our statutory obligation uh, to protect the identity of confidential uh, complainants, witnesses, and whistleblowers. We and Congress rely on these individuals for vital information, and we do not want to discourage them from uh, bringing their allegations forward. Beyond the Integrity Committee, Individual IGs, we have the responsibility of promoting accountability and transparency in our larger departments. And I want to briefly highlight an effort that we have recently made uh, in my office to further accountability at the Department of Labor. In July, we launched the OIG recommendation dashboard on our website to highlight the recommendations that have not been implemented by the department, some dating back several years. Uh, we follow the lead of the Department of Transportation, OIG, and others in developing this dashboard. Uh, DOL leadership has embraced this new tool, and the dashboard has substantially improved accountability. Indeed, since alerting DOL leadership about the dashboard, DOL agencies have reduced the number of unimplemented recommendations by 44%. Mr. Chairman, uh, stakeholders look to the Integrity Committee uh, to provide fair, timely, and impartial uh, disposition of the allegations against senior OIG officials. We will continue to work with this subcommittee and other uh, committees in Congress to strengthen the integrity of the IG community uh, and to improve our processes to be more timely and transparent. I want to publicly thank my fellow uh, committee members uh, for their dedicated service and for the substantial time that they devote to this important, to these, this important work. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Dahl. Uh, and we uh, thank you all for your testimony. I'm going to call on the gentleman from California, Mr. Khanna. I know you've got a, another commitment, so why don't you go first with your five-minute question. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Thank you for uh, convening this hearing. Mr. Horowitz, uh, uh, as you know, uh, the we Whistleblower Protection Act does not cover whistleblowers in the intelligence community. There's a separate law, the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act, that allows whistleblowers to disclose information to the Inspector General for the intelligence community. Is that correct? Uh, yes. And this law is critical because it provides a protected channel for whistleblowers in the intelligence community to expose unlawful behavior, waste, fraud, or abuse, even if it involves classified information. Is that correct? That's correct. And in the past, administrations have always complied with sending this information of the complaint over to Congress. Some of them have not made a determination to send over classified information. But is it correct that in the past, every administration has, within seven days, transferred the complaint itself to Congress? Um, I couldn't speak to every single instance. We've had one, and in that instance, um, it went forward per the statutory requirements. Is it true that you could forward the complaint to Congress without disclosing classified information per the statute? Um, depending on the facts, you could. I, Obviously, you could redact anything. Situation. You certainly could redact anything that was classified and put In the theory, yes. complaint forward. And is it your understanding that the law requires the Director of National Intelligence to forward this information to Congress within seven days? It's my understanding that the leader that gets the report, in my case it would be the Attorney General, is required to send it. In the DNI circumstance, it would be the uh, DNI. And do you understand the word shall in the statute going back to uh, Marbury versus Madison as requiring meaning shall means must? Is that correct? As a, as a general rule, when I look at a statute, if I see shall, I understand that to be must. 
why is it important that uh, inspector generals have the ability to make independent decisions about whistleblower complaints uh, and, uh, uh, and have that authority? Uh, well, there are a slew of reasons, um, but that's one of the reasons why we've created this website for whistleblowers. We, they provide us with critical information. And in the intelligence world, um, they need to go through proper channels because of the classified information, and the statute provides that proper channel. And why is it important in the intelligence community whistleblowers that they have a protected process to disclose information to both the Inspector General and Congress? Uh, precisely because it is classified information, and my understanding of this statute is it was created in response to other disclosures that didn't occur in the orderly way, um, and this Congress passed the law to make sure whistleblowers had a way that they could legally send information, provide information to Congress about matters they thought were improper. So if there is a whistleblower who has sent something to the Inspector General, and the Inspector General has sent it to the Director of National uh, Intelligence, uh, saying that it should be transmitted to Congress, do you see any reason for the Director of National Intelligence not to transmit the complaint itself to the Congress? Um, I'll speak to it in my understanding, since I have not dealt directly with the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence. Um, we would expect the Attorney General to follow through on a uh, similar matter that we would provide to him in this case, if it had been him, um, and to follow through on the statute. And what would you say if the Attorney General didn't uh, just said, I don't believe we need to follow the law and I'm not going to transmit to this to Congress, what would you tell the Attorney General? Um, in that situation, we I'd probably figure out a way pursuant to the Inspector General Act, following the law, to notify Congress about my concerns of a failure to follow the law. What do you think should be the consequence for an executive branch official who just fails to follow the law? Just says, I don't need to follow the law. Well, I spent several years up here um, on access issues that I was adv having, advocating for a change in the law and for some mechanism to move forward. And, um, we succeeded ultimately in that. Um, obviously, what we're supposed to do as IGs is follow the law and get you and, and our leaderships the information the law requires us to get them. And then it should be the system that works through and follows the law from there forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Massey, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for the work you do. Mr. Horowitz, you said you call balls and strikes, whether it's popular or unpopular, and more than often it's unpopular. I, I might say that should be a measurement of how well that inspector general is doing, is how unpopular the information is inside of Washington, D.C. But the information you provide is crudal, crucial outside of Washington, D.C., and it is appreciated there. It's the uh, 10th year of the Council of Inspector General, but it's also the 18th year of the war in Afghanistan. So I want to highlight some of the work that one of the inspectors general has done overseeing the spending there for Afghan reconstruction. Uh, a serious metric of the work of an inspector general might be the amount of money that you save the taxpayer. And there's one program in Afghanistan where we uh, provided UH-60s, these are Black Hawk helicopters, and it was a boondoggle. And we've already saved $200 million over there because the Inspector General highlighted that program. Another thing I learned from that Inspector General that we've not been able to fix yet is we spent $8 billion eradicating drugs in Afghanistan. $8 billion on that program alone, and they've doubled poppy production. These are things that I wouldn't know about. We wouldn't have been able to save money here in Congress if it weren't for the Inspector General there. So I, I want to say whether you think we should still be in Afghanistan or not be in Afghanistan, hopefully we can all agree here today that the last person to leave Afghanistan is, shouldn't be a soldier. It should be the inspector general if we're spending billions of dollars over there. I mean, until we turn the lights off over there, we should. Uh, and do you agree, Mr. Horowitz? Um, I'm not sure that the IG for Afghan reconstruction would appreciate me saying he should be the last person left <laughs> in Afghanistan. Okay, and IG. But maybe uh, not Mr. Sopko. But to my point on shutdowns, uh, we should be in integrated into spending to make sure, because I agree with you completely, that that yeah. spending is done wisely. The taxpayers expect that. And 
one of, one of the things, and whether this was in Congress's wisdom or they just didn't think about this, is they gave that IG a sort of whole of government uh, you know, mandate mm -hmm. where any branch of the government that spends money, he can investigate if it's being spent on money there in Afghanistan. I think that's what's led to some of these good results, and I, I hope we do more of that, not by accident, but by intention. But there is a troubling trend that, that I think we're running up against in Afghanistan, and that is, you know, this, this meeting is about transparency. We're running in to a problem with transparency for Afghanistan. We, they no longer re report um, for the Afghan soldiers, the desertion rates, the amount of territory controlled, the population that's under control of the Taliban, the casualties of Afghan soldiers, the capabilities of Afghan military. Some of that's just not collected, and some of it's now classified. So even the IG can't provide it or get it. And I think that's a troubling trend that I, I hope your council will look into for us over there. So uh, switching gears a little bit, I've got a, a more specific question about the DOJ. And this is, this is timely, I think, because Congress is discussing background checks. The last year that there was a report uh, of DOJ prosecutions for people who failed a background check was 2010. Mm -hmm. And I think this is information that we need to know. And I'll tell you why I think we need to know it. There was, in 2010, the last year we had this information from the DOJ, 70, over 72,000 applications were denied, yet there were uh, only 62 charges brought. Out of 70, over 72,000 denials, there were only 62 charges brought by, the, by federal prosecutors on those denials, and that would be falsified information when buying a firearm, possession of firearm by convicted felon. By the way, there were only 11 of those out of 72,000. So the reason, so I would like to see this report done again. It was done for five years from 2006 to 2010. I think one of the reasons they quit doing the report is it actually shows that a lot of these denials are false denials and or we're not prosecuting the criminals. So I would love to see that report done again. I know you can't guarantee that here, but do you have any thoughts on that? Um, let me go back. I believe we've touched on this issue in one of our reports on some more recent data, so let me check and we can get back in touch with you on what that is. We've identified in our reports um, some of the concerns on the NIC system as it's managed by the FBI uh, in both regards, any, both it, false positives it, and false negatives. Any employer who had this many false positives when doing a background check on employees would be sued out of existence. Mm -hmm. And, that, and so that's one of the reasons I think we need to look into the background check system. And I would appreciate, maybe the IGs could do that, but appreciate your work. And I, you, in, do you have any comments? And No, I was just going to say, I, let me follow up and see what the work is that we've done on that and, and get back to you. Thank you all for showing up today and what, for the work you do. Thank you. I thank you, gentlemen. And I associate myself with this remark. Um, I think especially what's happened in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and there's a great example where special inspectors general have done a great job in trying to highlight an enormous amount of money with very little payoff, and in some cases, negative payoff, apparently. Uh, Chair now recognizes the general lady. D Mr. Jordan, did you have an intervention? No. Okay. Uh, uh, general lady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Connolly. I, I want to thank you for this hearing. It may not seem the most scintillating of hearings. It may be among our most important because of the importance of the IG and uh, SIGI it, itself. Um, I want to congratulate Mr. Uh, 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 Chairman Horowitz on the whistleblower website. Um, I think that will perhaps more than anything else uh, educate uh, the public on what is possible. Um, I'm interested in what appears to be a flaw or a vacuum in oversight. Uh, but, but let me uh, begin, uh, Chairman Hor Horowitz, Chairman Buller, Chairman Dahl, by thanking you for this important work that is so important to all the work we do Everybody knows that if there's an IG report, 
particularly considering the polarization in Congress, that's where people look to to see what the real facts and real circumstances are. So your work becomes more and more important the more uh, divided the Congress itself is. And of course, Congress relies very heavily on you, both sides, no matter where we, we are from. We all bow to IG when it comes to reports you submit. Um, now, um, uh, the gap uh, uh, that uh, we may have discovered uh, is in ensuring accountability of an IG who may be accused of wrongdoing. Uh, under current law, the special counsel may refer a whistleblower to an agency head to investigate it. That's the way it's always done. And if there is a substantial likelihood uh, that there may be a violation of law or wastewater abuse, uh, safety, public safety, uh, health endangered, um, the agency must then conduct an investigation of the disclosure and then submit that report, I hate to sound bureaucratic here, but this is how it works, to the, um, to the special counsel, then investigates it to see if the findings are reasonable. That's the process. Now, given that process, let me cite to you a real life example. Um, the special counsel attempted to refer to Zig Ziggy a disclosure of wrongdoing by the Department of Defense IG uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago actually, in withholding information from the Secretary of Defense. Uh, uh, sorry, that the Secretary of Defense had leaked classified information uh, with respect to something called the Zero Dark Thirty movie. The special counsel referred the disclosure to Ziggy uh, to avoid a potential conflict of interest in having the DOD IG investigate the matter. As I understand it, Ziggy refused to investigate it, claiming that the Inspector General uh, Empowerment Act of 2016 stripped uh, the Office of Special Counsel of any authority over Ziggy itself. Now, it looks like there's nobody to investigate uh, or that some kind of loophole or vacuum is created if that is the case. Um, so let me ask you, all of you perhaps, if the Special Counsel if the special counsel has the authority to refer disclosures to agencies and require them to investigate, is there reason, any reason why we cannot impose the same requirement on IGs? And if not, who is to watch the government watchdogs if any of them is accused of wrongdoing. So let me take that first and then Mr. Dahl can jump in. Uh, you, you may answer the question, but the general lady's time is about to expire. Uh, the issue becomes a challenging one because it, the Office of Special Counsel, I just want to clarify for those watching, it's not the special counsel that people may generally be familiar with. Mr. Mueller, we're talking about now about the Office of Special Counsel that exists. Mm. Uh, to deal with whistleblower complaints. Their statute currently, as currently written, requires reports, as you mentioned, to go to agency heads, and even if it involves an IG or a, an employee of the IG. We've worked through this issue with the current um, head of the Office of Special Counsel to try and arrange a process by which um, allegations against IGs are investigated by either the Integrity Committee in appropriate cases or inspectors general as the IG Act provides. So we are in fact trying to deal with that situation and understand the concern there can't be a gap in who investigates 
alleged wrongdoing. Could Whether I just ask, do you need more legislation? Would legislation help in this regard? It, it might, um, but so far we've been able to work through these issues. Mr. Dahl, myself, have worked with the special counsel, Mr. Kerner, um, and, and our staffs to put in place or to try and reach an MOU so that we can work through the statutory, I'll call it potential tension, between the whistleblower statute and the IG Act. We think we can work it out. We think there's a process. Um, we think, frankly, the IG Empowerment Act transferring jurisdiction to SIGI has helped that process so that we can manage it as opposed to working through the FBI on that issue. And I know Mr. Dahl. So the general lady's time has expired, um, but I assure you there will be legislation in your future. Uh, Mr. Meadows and I introduced the bill yesterday, um, and uh, our hope is it will be marked up in an expeditious fashion, Ms. Norton, uh, and, and we'll double check to make sure the issue you've raised has been addressed. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Heiss, is recognized for his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all for being here. Mr. Horowitz, I know there's a probably limited uh, conversation you can have on, on this regarding the Pfizer report, and I'm not going to try to go too deeply, but just some, some questions for understanding. I know this is something the President wants as much as possible to be known to the public, and I think the American people deserve to know how all this debacle began. Um, but I also know that a lot of it was classified. Can you, can you just generally say percentage-wise about how much of that report is classified? Um, I'm not going to get into percentages of reports at this point. Uh, I'll just say as we um, wrote to our oversight committees, um, including this committee and Ranking Member Jordan, um, we've provided a draft of our report for classification marking purposes. So what the percentage is precisely will depend on what the Attorney General and the Department and the FBI decide after they evaluate it. And, and that's the process it's in right now. Okay, are you working with the uh, Department of Justice to have some of that declassified? Um, right now, what we've done is meet with the um, folks at the Justice Department and the FBI to tell them what, what we've done so far. They have the draft of the factual information that we've developed. We've talked through the classification issues with them, but it's ultimately up to them to decide what's going to be marked and how it's going to be marked or how it's not going to be marked. That's that's normal process. That's how it would occur. Um, we may weigh in once we see it back as to what our views are, okay. uh, as, to, as to any disagreements. So there could exist. be a point that you would weigh in. in that's court. correct. Okay. That is usual process. These, are, these rarely go in a one straight line process. Okay. Gotcha. Regarding... Uh, uh, Attorney uh, John Durham, uh, are are, are y'all in any discussions about what he's finding and what you have found? Um, I'm going to defer to him and the Attorney General on, on that issue as to what they're doing. Um, I have had communications with him, but it's really they're a um, separate entity that's He's working on okay. the direction of the Attorney General. I'm obviously independent. Do you know if he ha has found any of the same concerns that you were concerned about? Um, you'd have to ask him on what he's found. I, I'm, not, I'm not in a position to speak for him. Okay. Uh, well, let's, let's go over to the uh, Comey report that uh, did uh, come out, if we can. Uh, you um, had mentioned that... Uh, I mean, obviously, he failed uh, in some of his responsibilities to protect some sensitive information, and you referred to his actions at one point as uh, a dangerous example. Can you elaborate a little bit of what you meant by uh, that term, uh, that he said a dangerous example? Yeah, we were particularly focused on the providing of information in the memo that was really a recording of his meeting, investigative meeting, um, to a journalist to put in the newspaper. That was not classified information. Not that particular memo didn't have classified information. Our concern there and why we refer to it that way is uh, we have instances in the my office, I've had this example as a federal prosecutor in corruption cases previously, 
where the law enforcement agents you're working with or who have worked on a matter may think a decision was not made for the right reasons. Um, and our concern was empowering FBI directors or frankly any FBI employee or other law enforcement official with the authority to decide that they're not gonna follow established norms and procedures because in their view, they've made a judgment that the individuals they're dealing with can't be trusted. So the fact that he was in the highest position of the FBI uh, would, would add to your level of concern. Correct. Um, now you, you actually uh, referred uh, criminal pro prosecution to the Department of Justice for Comey, correct? We're required by the IG Act to send information that we've identified that could plausibly be criminal to the department. With, and we've That's pretty that. monumental. Do you know of any FBI director who in the past has ever had a criminal prosecution? I referral? wouldn't know as I sit here today. Or any other head of any federal agency? Um, I do, actually, so okay. I, but I'll keep that. All right, and, and the same type referral applied same to McCabe issue. as well. Right, the IG, the IG Act requires me to expeditiously report to the Attorney General when I see evidence that could be considered criminal, and okay. we follow the law. Okay, thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin, is recognized for his five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Inspector General Horowitz, the committee's investigating efforts by the Department of Education to interfere with the integrity of its Inspector General Office and its operations. On December 17th last year, Education Committee Chairman Bobby Scott requested that the IG examine at education, at the Department of Education, examine the department's decision to restore recognition of the accreditor for several failed for-profit universities. And the Education Department was apparently unhappy with the IG's subsequent decision to conduct this investigation the leadership was apparently so perturbed and threatened by the IG investigation that they tried to shut it down. On January 3rd of 2019, Deputy Secretary of Education Mitchell Zeiss wrote a letter to the Acting Inspector General Sandra Bruce asking her to drop the investigation, and if she refused, demanding that she change its scope by having it take a, a deeper historical dive into the Obama administration. When Ms. Bruce responded to the department's request, uh, naturally by asserting her institutional independence as the inspector general, the deputy secretary ordered her to step down from the position. The, bar the department apparently planned to replace um, her as an independent IG with an agency insider, the deputy general counsel currently at the department. Were these actions by the Department of Education appropriate? Um, no, we were, I was very concerned about it when I heard about it from acting IG Bruce, and I worked with her to address the issue, and which successfully occurred. Have we seen similar kinds of assaults on the independence and integrity of inspector generals and other departments? Um, frankly, over time, there have been. As I mentioned in my opening, it's a perpetual challenge for us. Um, agencies always aren't always enamored with our oversight efforts. Was there anything wrong with, uh, or is there anything wrong with committees in Congress or members of Congress writing to inspectors generals, urging them to uh, investigate this or that alleged misconduct? Not at all. I get those pretty frequently. After this committee urged the White House uh, to reverse course in firing Ms. Bruce, the department reinstated her as the acting inspector general, but the department is refusing to make individuals available for interviews about how and why the decision was made to fire her in the first place. Ms. Bruce has been serving as acting IG for over nine months. President Trump has still not appointed an individual to fill this position on a permanent basis. Uh, Mr. Horowitz, when you testified before this committee last November, there were 14 vacant IG positions, and 12 of those were presidentially appointed Senate-confirmed positions. As you stated in your testimony, there are still 12 vacancies. Why is this a problem for the government? Um, frankly, and again, this has been a perpetual challenge for us, um, IGs are not a priority, or don't seem to be a priority, I, I should say, um, when considering vacancies in the government. And that's true, frankly, when nomination, in terms of nominating people, and also, frankly, getting them confirmed promptly. And, and what is the 
the impact of all of these vacancies on public policy? It's a significant problem. Um, acting IGs, like Acting IG Bruce, do an outstanding job. There was a 15-month vacancy at the DOJ between Mr. Fine leaving and me getting the position. Um, and the Acting IG, who was the deputy, did a fine job. But you, you don't have the ability to push back when that independence issue comes up in quite the same way. I'm Senate confirmed. Ms. Bruce's predecessor was Senate confirmed. There's a certain authority that comes with that when you come before Congress and when you deal with Congress and when you deal with your leadership because they know you're there. They know they can't remove you. It has to be, and it can only be the president. The Attorney General has no authority of me. The Secretary of Education had no authority over Ms. Bruce's predecessor. That's a big difference. The President hasn't even nominated a candidate for nine of these positions, including the Departments of Education, Defense, Treasury, HHS, and the EPA. The Department of Defense, with a budget of more than $700 billion, has not had a permanent IG since January of 2016. Um, what can be done to put this on the radar? Well, one of the things that was done is last week, uh, on the Senate side, the Homeland Security Committee there, which handles IG nominations, wrote a bipartisan letter of the entire committee. I, I think it was the entire committee. It was a bipartisan letter to the president saying, you need to nominate people, and we in the Senate need to do a better job moving those nominations. Both of those problems have existed, and they've been existing, frankly, for many years. It's been something in four years as chair of this committee, uh, as chair of SIGI. Um, I've talked about with presidential personnel in the prior administration, in this administration. We just got an interior IG confirmed finally after almost eight years of vacancies. Right. Well, I agree with your sense of urgency uh, about the importance of this issue, and uh, I think we stand ready in this committee to help out. I thank the gentleman, uh, and I certainly agree uh, we need to move these uh, uh, confirmations in the Senate. In fact, maybe if we spent more time confirming IGs instead of federal judges, we'd all be better off. Uh, <laughs> if the gentleman would. Of course. Perhaps since it's independent, maybe we work on a bipartisan piece of legislation to make it where it's not Senate confirmed. I mean, actually, those appointments, if we could truly make it where it's not Senate confirmed, move, move it through where you have the IG committee. Let's, let's at least see if we can work on it. Fair enough. Uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stubbe, is recognized for his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Horowitz, uh, I'm going to kind of pick up where Mr. Heiss left off. Um, he, he was asking you about the fact that Comey had been referred criminally by um, your report, and that's correct? That's correct. Um, you also referred Andy McCabe for federal prosecution. Is that correct? Um, I will say we, we made the same referral pursuant to the IG Act, as with Mr. Comey, as we do whenever that provision applies. And that's a criminal referral? That's as the IG Act requires us to do, yes. And so was McCabe the acting director when you referred him? Um, I'm not going to get into the precise timing, actually, yeah, of it. Right. But the, the answer would be no, because actually, I can say that he, but by the time the issue um, uh, came to be, it was after August 1st, which is, I think, the August 1st of 2017, 2017, which is, I think, the date of Director Ray's installation. Okay, and why did you refer him for criminal prosecution, McCabe? Um, why was he referred? We made a, as the public report, I'll stick to what's public, the public report, we found a lack of candor, um, which means we didn't find that he provided us truthful information, and um, when we made a determination under Section 4 of the IG Act, that we thought that it occurred, we were required by the law to report it expeditiously to the Attorney General. So in other words, he lied. I mean, I, you say lack of candor. We, uh, we make a lack of candor finding. I'm going to defer to the prosecutors. I, I, in a report last year, we criticized the FBI director for usurping the authority of the Attorney General to make prosecutorial decisions. I'm not going to do that today. Okay. And you also found that McCabe failed to safeguard FBI information. Is that correct? Um, well, what we found was, um, just to be clear, that he had provided information to or, or authorized an employee to provide information to a reporter that was FBI information. 
So we have two heads of the FBI, one director, one acting director, we think close around to the timeline, both referred for criminal prosecution. Is that, I'm, I'm saying Pursuant that to the IG Act, we made referrals in both instances. So I, I want to point out how profound that is for those sitting at home and for the American people, that we have two back-to-back -back heads of the FBI, both referred for criminal prosecution. Both of these heads of the FBI failed to safeguard sensitive FBI information. Is that correct? In both instances, they disclosed to reporters information that was protected FBI information, sensitive law enforcement. And I, I want to move quickly to the latest report on Comey, and I'm going to just read from page 52. Mm -hmm. In this analysis section, we address whether Comey's actions violated department and FBI policies or the terms of Comey's FBI employment agreement. We determined that several of his actions did. We conclude that the memos were official FBI records rather than Comey's personal documents. Accordingly, after his removal as director, Comey violated applicable policies and his employment agreement by failing to either surrender his copies of memos 2, 4, 6, and 7 to the FBI or seek authorization to retain them. By releasing official FBI information records to third parties without authorization and by failing to immediately alert the FBI about his disclosures to his personal attorneys, once he became aware on June the 27th that memo two contained words that were classified at the confidential level. Did I read that accurately? I don't have it in front of me, but it certainly sounds like that's accurate. Uh, you've, so you previously faulted the FBI director in your report of last year. In your report on Comey's memos, you wrote, we have previously faulted Comey for acting unilaterally and inconsistent with department policy. That was the Clinton email IG report. Correct. In your report on the FBI's investigation of the Clinton emails, you wrote, end quote, we found that it was extraordinary and insubordinate for Comey to conceal his intentions from his superiors, the acting attorney, the attorney general and deputy attorney general for the admitted purpose of preventing them from telling him not to make the statement and to instruct his subordinates in the FBI to do the same. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't have the language in front of me, but it's uh, page, certainly re I certainly recall that general line. It's Clinton email IG report, page 241. You use the words extraordinary and insubordinate. Uh, you're not exactly someone who would make such bold characterizations. In that, in that case, you found his misconduct merited these conclusions? Yes. You found Comey's conduct this year just as troubling, correct? Um, we found it troubling. I'm not going to make a relative judgment as to which was Well, you wrote, and I quote, Comey's unauthorized disclosure of sensitive law enforcement information about the Flynn investigation merits similar criticism. Page 61, Comey memo correct. report. Correct. Merits similar criticism. Agreed. I, I, I want to thank you uh, for your time here today, and uh, I, I just think it's beholden on the American people that they get to read this information and it becomes public. I thank the gentleman, and perfect timing. I, I, I tried to wrap it up there. You right did it the perfectly. Mr. Jordan, did you wish to be recognized? Unless the ranking member wanted to go. Uh, he's deferring to you. Okay. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Uh, Horwitz, let me pick up right where the gentleman from Florida was. Uh, and I appreciate the letter you sent to uh, Chairman and Ranking Member last Friday on the upcoming FISA report that is now at, with the Attorney General. Um, but let me, let me go first to what... Mr. Stubbe just talked about. Have you been asked to testify uh, by the chairman, uh, by Chairman Cummings or Chairman Nadler about the, the Comey IG report you released three weeks ago? Um, no, I'm not. Have you been approached at all by the, the chairman of those respective committees? Personally, I have not. I can check with anybody else in my organization, but I'm not aware of any. Have they, they been asked you about it? Oh, I'm sure they've asked about it. But that, I mean, sorry, ask about, about, you, ask about, about you testifying and answering questions about that specific report. About a hearing, I don't no believe hearing. there have been discussions. Have you had any discussions with Chairman Cummings or Chairman Nadler about the upcoming FISA report, particularly subsequent to this letter, or even before this letter, um, about the FISA report when you might testify in front of either committee? Um, we haven't had, to my knowledge, discussions about um, testimony or or a hearing. We've but had you would, discussion, Joan, about the report and timing, but not about. I think in your in your letter you point out you talked to uh, over, look uh, over a hundred interviews, over a million records your your team examined. Uh, you spent a lot of time on this report. This is pretty significant. You would anticipate testifying in front of both the House Oversight Committee, which has jurisdiction over the Inspector Generals, mm -hmm. and the House Judiciary Committee. Is that right? Um, I guess on I would say as to any of my reports, I always um, am available and willing to testify. Um, I'm not sure I'd want to uh, advocate for being in four hearings, two here and two on the Senate side. So 
Well, we combined them last year, a uh, year and a half ago yes. on one. We, we did that. So all I know is I think, as, as Mr. Stubbe said, this is important information, and frankly, the American people would like to see it. Let me go, if I could, to um, the recent IG report about Mr. Comey's leaked, uh, leaked memos. And I want to I read from it. I'm, I'm talking about, on page 17 of your report, January 7, 2017, memo number one. And you say Comey first, uh, uh, Comey's first one-on-one meeting, one -on -one meeting with President Trump occurred on January 6, 2017. Is that right? That's right. And before briefing President, I'm reading from your report, before brief, briefing President-elect Trump, Mr. Comey met with senior leaders at the FBI, Jim Rabicki, mm -hmm. Andy McCabe, Jim Baker, and supervisors of the FBI's investigation. Is that right? Again, I don't have it in front of me, but that's my report. Yeah, so he has a pre-meeting. <clears throat> They're going to go up to brief President-elect Trump. Right. January 6, 2017, so it's President-elect Trump at the time. They have a pre-meeting to figure out what, how this is going to go. And actually, even more of a pre-meeting they have with Mr. Clapper and Mr. Brennan to figure out how exactly the briefing for the President-elect is going to happen. Is that right? And who's going to do it. And who's going to do what. Right. right. And they break it into two parts. All of them brief the President-elect on general assessment, mm -hmm. uh, intelligence assessment, the ICA. And then they all leave, and Mr. Comey sits down with the President. Is that right? Um, that's my recollection, yes. Um, so Mr. Comey sits down with President-elect Trump and talks to him about what? Um, again, I don't have the report in front of me, but my recollection is what we were told is it's about the what has come to be known as the salacious and unverified reporting about um, certain events in Moscow. Witnesses interviewed by the OIG also said they discussed Trump's potential responses to being told about the salacious information in the dossier, including that President Trump might make statements about or provide information of value to a pending Russia interference investigation. Is that right? That's my recollection. Yeah, so, he, so Comey stuck around and briefed him on the dossier. Well, on, and, that, on that one piece understand, of my recollection. Understand. Um, so what I'm interested in is, is we always thought that this meeting was to give the president the intelligence assessment and, and fill him and give him a briefing. He's president-elect. Um, but it now looks like, based on what you wrote at the bottom of page 17, that they included trying to get information on the pending in Russia interference. So it wasn't just information going one way. They were actually trying to get information from the president as well. Is that right? That's what we've reported. That's different. That's different. That's something I don't think we knew before. Multiple FBI witnesses recalled agreeing ahead of time that Comey should memorialize this event after it happened, right? Right. So he gets in the car on the way home, and he immediately starts memorializing what took place. It's interesting. One of the things that he said, the reason they did this was because they thought the president-elect might misrepresent, misrepresent what happened in the encounter. Remember that from the report? Uh, vaguely. Yeah. Again, I'd have to... It says it on page eight, 18. I think that's, a, that's, that's amazing to me because... The irony was the only one misrepresenting anything, it seems to me, was Mr. Comey, because all the while he's trying to get information from the president about the pending investigation, he's been telling the president he's not even under investigation. I thank the gentleman. Uh, if, Mr. Horowitz, you want to respond. You know, I, I have no, nothing further to say. I would stand thank by you. our report. Could I ask one question, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mr. Horowitz, was, was President Trump under investigation at the time that this all happened on January 6th? Um, I don't know that I'm in a position to say one way or another. I've read what the memos say and what Mr. Comey in the memos reported he represented to the president that the president was not, or the president-elect at the time. He'd in not. fact been told by the very guy who had to memorialize this conversation, was trying to get information from the president, that he wasn't in right. fact under investigation by that very individual. Yeah, I, I think, And all I can speak to is what is in what the memos, said, what was said. I don't know independently what was going on in the investigation. Thank you. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, the distinguished ranking member is recognized for his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Horowitz, I'm going to follow up a little bit on where uh, uh, Mr. Jordan just said. But before I do that, I, I want to say this. Uh, the chairman and I were talking about, we appreciate your professionalism. Uh, the fact that he can't influence you and the fact that I can't influence you may frustrate both of us, but we both appreciate the fact that we can't okay. actually affect your independence. And, and here's, mm -hmm. if your IG community at DOJ shared information with the media 
the way that you found in your inspections, would that undermine your overall objective uh, in terms of sharing information with the media? If anyone on my staff yes. did that, there would be serious consequences because it would have a significant effect on our work. And so wouldn't you draw the same con con conclusion that sharing information under ongoing investigations within the DOJ and FBI is not a practice that we should actually embrace? Absolutely. Uh, did you find that in some of your uh, Inspector General's report uh, on what has already been published with, with relationship to uh, Director James Comey? Uh, we did. Uh, multiple times? Um, well, we have in, in that report the one instance where it occurred through Mr. Richmond to the press. All right. Do you, once you have a report that is out, and once we've read the report, mm -hmm. do you go back and look at congressional testimony to, cor uh, to correlate between what you were told under oath by witnesses versus testimony that has been given to Congress to make sure that those two come together? Um, if we're aware of it and it relates directly to it, yes, but obviously we're not uh, up to date on all the different testimonies that occurred. So usually we rely on the referrals. Right. And, and so, so that's where I, I'm kind of going uh, to this because we've taken now your report mm -hmm. and we've put it side by side uh, congressional testimony that James Comey made before the uh, Joint Oversight and Judiciary hearing, and I'm finding uh, just a number of irregularities. So would it be appropriate if uh, Chairman, uh, I mean, Ranking Member Jordan and I were to refer those inconsistencies to the IG, and if we did that, would the IG look at those inconsistencies? It's certainly appropriate for us to get a referral, a referral about a then employee of the department, which is, I think, the hearing you're probably referencing. And then we would assess it. And as you indicated before, we would make an independent assessment of whether it's appropriate. For well, us well I'll give you one example. Mr. Gowdy was asking, it said, did you initiate an obstruction of justice investigation based on what the president said? It was a very clear question. Mr. Comey said, uh, I don't think so. I don't recall doing that, so I don't think so. However, on page 13 of your IG's report, it said that Comey purposely leaked the memo so that they could have a special counsel appointed to investigate obstruction of justice. So two of those cannot be true. They're, they're at opposite dynamics in terms of what they're constructing, and, and we have dozens of examples where that has happened. Is that something that would be important for the American people to know and for you to look into? Um, I guess I would say, as in any situation, we'd want to get the referral, the testimony, and so we could make... So we'll be referring those inconsistencies to you today, Mr. Horowitz, and I think that it's important that the American people get to look at this. Uh, my understanding is, from reports that in from your letter that you have official uh, officially uh, given the FISA abuse work that you've done over to be reviewed by the appropriate parties at DOJ. Is that correct? So we've given our factual findings to the department for their marking. What we then do once we get it back, whether we have to go back and forth on the markings is one issue. Right. Once those are final, we then take that and try and write our public report from that. Right. Because we want to make as much of this public. Sometimes we'll have to either redact information or write around it, but that would be the next stage after this. So we're so, not quite final yet. Right. So at this point, can you rule out the fact that there will be uh, any criminal referrals as it relates to this new uh, FISA abuse uh, report that is coming out? Can you rule that out? I, I'm not going to speak to that issue one way or the other. All right. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman, is recognized for five minutes. Yeah, for Mr. Horowitz, um, I want to direct your attention to conclusions involving Comey failing to safeguard the uh, FBI's Flynn investi investigation, which is going on at the time. You wrote Comey's senior, uh, closest senior FBI advisors were shocked when they learned the former FBI director instructed the release of his memo containing information about the ongoing FBI investigation, right? That's correct. What specifically did they did uh, they say to your office? 
um, I, I don't have the report in front of me, but I remember them saying words like shock, surprise, those, those kinds of words when they learned that he had released the information through Mr. Richmond to a reporter. And they were unsolicited reactions? Uh, yes, they were during testimony under oath that were recorded. Why do you think they were shocked or stunned? Um, well, it was completely inconsistent, as we wrote in the report, with department policy and how um, we expect, and I think they expect, FBI employees to handle law enforcement information. Okay. One advisor used the term disappointed to describe Comey's misconduct. Can you explain why they'd be disappoint disappointed in the FBI director? Well, I, I'm not going to speak to what was in their mind when they said the words, but um, I can say again, I think there's a general understanding in the department and within the FBI that when you have law enforcement information, you don't disclose it uh, to the press when there's an ongoing criminal investigation, which there was at the time. Okay. Comey uh, discussed or showed contents of the memos with people outside the FBI, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, then Acting DA Administrator Chuck Rosenberg saw a Comey memo, right? I, th I, I, I don't have the report in front of me. I think that's correct. I think okay. they either talked about it or he showed it to them. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I, I, have, I right now have a vote in another committee, so I'm going to yield the rest of my time to Congressman Gross. I think I thank the gentleman for yielding. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, Mr. Horowitz, uh, I want to go back to page 17, mm -hmm. uh, where we were a few minutes ago. Before briefing President-elect Trump, Comey met with senior leaders of the FBI, including Chief of Staff Jim Rubicki, then FBI Deputy Director Andy McCabe, then FBI General Counsel Jim Baker, and the supervisors of the FBI's investigation of the Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. So he meets with his key players, key team, uh, people heading the investigation, and, and the top people at the FBI. Goes up to Trump Tower, has the meeting, his one-on-one -on -one meeting with the president where he briefs him on the dossier. That meeting is done. He immediately comes back out and starts recording what took place, memorializing the conversation with the president-elect. Right? Correct. Uh, multiple FBI witnesses recalled agreeing ahead of time that Comey should memorialize this meeting. So the same people that he met with in the pre-meeting said, hey, when you go talk with the president-elect, as soon as you come out, we're going to have a secure laptop, you write it all down. Right. And you need to write it all down because we think the president-elect might misrepresent something later on, right? Uh, if I recall correctly, that was one of the reasons. One of the reasons, all right? even though the very guy who's in there giving the briefing is misrepresenting a fundamental fact to the President of the United States, telling him he's not under investigation when they're actually trying to set the President up, in my opinion, get information from the President. So he goes back out, he memorializes this, and then you say in the next paragraph down, um, he memorialized mem Memo 1, and, and he had it that way until he arrived at FBI's New York field office where Comey gave a quick download of his conversation with the very same people who he had the pre-meeting with, Mr. Rubicki, Mr. McCabe, Mr. Baker, and supervisors of the FBI Crossfire Hurricane investigation. Is that all accurate? Uh, that's my recollection. Okay, so you, you used three names twice, Rubic Rubicki, McCabe, and Baker, and then you, instead of saying other names, you say supervisors. Are those supervisors the people who I suspect they are, the people who ran the Crossfire Hurricane? Are those supervisors Peter Strzok and Lisa Page? Um, I don't recall as I sit here, I'd have to go back and look um, at it, and if we can, uh, with all of these issues, we have to look at the Privacy Act and, and other um, laws to see what we can do, but I'll go back and check. I'm not sure that is the case, so let me could go be, back and check. Could, could it be a bigger number than those two? If it's not those two, it could be or other could, two. Or it could, it could be, be others. It could be others as well, or it could be uh, yes. those two plus others. It, I don't know as I sit here who, um, were those individuals. Is it likely that Peter Strzok is one in, the, in, 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 in knowing that he was the guy who led the Crossfire Hurricane investigation? Um, I actually have no idea if that's likely or not, uh, because um, I'm not sure that's entirely accurate that your reference to what his role was at various times. Okay. I, I thank the gentleman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you, thank you Mr. Jordan. The chair now recognizes himself for his five minutes. And I'm going to ask questions quickly and ask you to answer quickly so I can fit them all in. I'm going to start with you, Ms. Buller, for a change. Um, have you had difficulty at EPA, I mean at the Peace Corps with your agency, in terms of access to information and responsiveness to requests made? Um, access, we've had a couple of little issues, but they've been worked through. Uh, 
we've had other issues, however, in dealing with uh, general counsel interpretations of our policy that try to limit the people who can come to us to report things and also try to uh, limit the way that we conduct our criminal investigations relating to volunteer drug use. And what's your redress? When that happens, what can you do? We have so far been working with the agency and uh, to try to resolve the issue, and hopefully we can do that. But um, as with the access issue, we do understand that we can come to Congress if we do. If Please we do. Thank you. Because I think on a bipartisan basis, we're committed to making sure you can do your job. Um, Mr. Horowitz, uh, one of the things that's come to our attention um, is, you know, allegations of wrongdoing and sexual harassment within the federal judiciary. And what we discovered was, however, the administrative office of the courts does not have an IG. Um, does, uh, as chairman of SIGI, um, do you all have an opinion about whether we ought to establish an IG for the administrative office of the federal courts of the United States? Um, I'm not going to weigh in on what should happen with another branch of government, because obviously it raises various kinds of How issues. very careful. Uh, but I will say that, speaking of our own work in the department, we've played a very important role in addressing sexual harassment, sexual misconduct in the Justice Department, and I'm not confident that would have occurred in the absence right. of the Inspector General. And so therefore, inferentially, one could conclude from that statement that we all benefit from having IGs, and presumably another branch of government might benefit too. I think there is a value in having independent oversight in whatever form it takes, and it's been my concern right. and why I appreciate the issues of prosecutorial. I would just say to my friend, the distinguished ranking member of the subcommittee, I think this is an issue we want to look into uh, because I think the legislative branch could benefit just like the, I mean, the uh, judicial branch could benefit just like both the executive and legislative branches have benefited. Uh, Mr. Dahl, transparency. My own experience and that of a former colleague of this committee um, was not felicitous with respect to transparency and communication when we presented to Siggy uh, an issue of professional behavior and ethical behavior. And putting aside who and the merits, I'm focused on process. What has happened? I mean. You indicated in your testimony you want to protect whistleblowers and people who come forward and so forth, and we agree. But on the other hand, we also want to make sure that a legitimate complaint or allegation brought to you is also respectfully managed and adjudicated, as opposed to we found no merit, thanks for calling us. Um, can you address that a little bit in terms of what's happened in the last four or five years to improve how we handle legitimate concerns brought to your attention. Because it's a delicate matter investigating a colleague and you're a small community. We understand that. We, ha we have that problem up here, uh, trying to look at the ethics of a colleague. Very difficult, very painful. But if you don't do it, who will? And, and so I'm interested in not how you proceed in the investigation, but once it's completed or judgment is made, how do you dispose of it with respect to the complainant? We share your, uh, that this is a legitimate interest for the complainant and, uh, and the transparency has to be there as, as the, the chairman noted for us to have that credibility with the, with the public and with Congress. And so we've endeavored in our uh, policies and procedures to build into those uh, a communication mechanism, uh, both to Congress, uh, certainly it's in the Empowerment Act now, that, w that we would inform Congress and, and at Congress's request we can provide that, that kind of level of detail. Um, uh, to the complainants, uh, we, uh, we look carefully at those and um, identify what information we can uh, relate to the uh, to the complainant, at the same time protecting, um, as I said before, the co confidentiality and, of the... And, and the if I may interrupt, it's, uh, the other thing you're trying to protect, and I understand that, and I think we're totally on board with you, is protecting someone's innocent reputation. 
anyone can make a complaint about anything at any time. That doesn't mean it's legit, and, and it certainly me means we need to be careful with that kind of thing, because raw data about complaints does not tell you anything. Um, and there may not be any merit to it. We want to respect that. But on the other hand, as I said, where a legitimate complaint about behavior by an IG comes to your attention, we've got to have confidence that it's been carefully vetted and adjudicated and a rational explanation that is more than we looked at it and there's nothing there, certainly when it comes to Congress, but, but even somebody within an agency or the public, as you pointed out, I think is entitled to more than that kind of dismissive answer. Mr. Horowitz, and then my time's up, did you want to comment? Yeah, just briefly, um, as I said, this was one of the first issues we talked about in January 2015 when I became chair of SIGI. That's right. The issue had already been pending, and I was, as we talked about, surprised at the response you got or the lack of response you got. Um, the, I, I think there is a significant, there has been a significant change since then with two intervening events, one Congress passing the IG Empowerment Act, and the second being the change in chairmanship of the committee so that SIGI owns the process now. Um, not that the FBI didn't care about the process or be part of it, they did. The problem is the FBI has 35,000 employees and a lot of significant issues on their plate, and IG oversight probably isn't the highest and, and, and there was also sort of a built-in bias, wasn't there? Not a negative thing to say. They're a law enforcement agency. So they're looking at illegal behavior, criminal behavior. Well, we're, we're looking at broader than that. Right. We're looking at Agreed. be purer than driven snow. Right. Um, yeah, I had this discussion with them when I came on board also. I get it. I worked with FBI agents. They have no authority to handle non-criminal administrative matters as part of their day jobs. That's right. So this was a collateral duty for them. We obviously understand the significance of it for all the reasons you've articulated and how to do them. And so I think there has been a, 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 an important change with both the shift in management of it, but also the policies and procedures put in. We very much look forward to continuing the dialogue with you. I, we couldn't agree more that the public, members of Congress, all of our stakeholders have to be confident in what we do. It's one of the reasons on the whistleblower side we've put so much effort into reaching out to the community, the stakeholders there, set up the web page, done, done that work, because they need to know they can trust us and come to us. Same here. We want, if there's real misconduct, actual misconduct, we also want to hear about it. We want to be the ones to find it. We want to be the ones to investigate it. We have, and I appreciate your comment about the numbers, because if anyone looks at just the incoming complaints versus the actual numbers, they might wonder, how do you get from 1,000 or more to 10 or 20 or 5? But we have a similar issue with our DOJ. OJ. I get 10,000 plus complaints a year. That a lot of those shouldn't belong with us and don't belong with us. Yeah. And here we have the added situation um, of it being easy to make a retaliatory complaint against an IG for doing their jobs and then complaining that somehow we were corrupt in what we did. Or biased. Or biased. Yeah. Now, that's not an unfair matter to come to us. To be clear, I'm not saying those that never could be the case. But the risk is it's coming to us solely because we did our jobs. I thank you so much. We're going to be submitting additional questions for the record, and if you could ex you know, expeditiously but thoughtfully try to answer those. Uh, and anybody who wants to submit additional questions, please uh, feel free to send them to the chair, and we will forward them. Um, and before I adjourn the uh, hearing, and I, th I want to thank all three of you for being here, uh, I want to call on the ranking member for any additional comments you may have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership on this. And again, thank you. Uh, you know, the, the great thing about the inspectors generals is that whether uh, there's a Democrat in the chair or a Republican in the chair, the value remains the same. And, uh, and so I just want to thank all of you for your work. Uh, I would say this. Uh, the chairman has, has just introduced a, a piece of legislation that is very meaningful, and I think it would be important for us to get it to markup as quickly as possible, get, get that uh, through the markup process and to the floor for a vote. Additionally, uh, you all have now hit on an area that is critically important. 
we, we can sit back and we look at IGs and we give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down or a, you know, a equivocate kind of mark based on um, a set of criteria that is very ambiguous, you know, uh, whether it's you, Mr. Dahl, or you, Ms. Butler, uh, or you, Mr. Horowitz. I mean, when we look at all of this, we judge you based on a standard that may not be fair. And so to the extent that we can work with you where we can say, this is what true independence is about. This is what true integrity is about. This is what happens when you don't get the information or you don't act upon it. Uh, I think the chairman and I are willing to work in a bipartisan way to make sure that you have all the tools that you need and uh, the financial resources as well. Uh, well said, and I thank my friend for his uh, continuing leadership and interest in these uh, issues. As uh, Ms. Norton said, they may not be headline issues, but they are about building a stronger government and more integrity within that government that better serves the American people. And I thank my friend for his collaboration. With that, this hearing is adjourned.